a mí no se me ocurre mejor manera de desmontar la, la viabilidad física del capitalismo que centrar la mirada en el funcionamiento de la naturaleza. Yo creo que el calentamiento global, pero también incluso eh, los procesos de agotamiento y de escasez de algunos de los recursos naturales, minerales fundamentalmente, que incluso necesitamos para poder hacer la transición a un modelo basado en renovables, eh, nos colocan de lleno ante pues, la imposibilidad o la, la contradicción esencial que existe en el desarrollo de vidas buenas para la mayor parte de la gente con eh, el funcionamiento de una lógica basada en el lucro y en los negocios. ¿no? Sin embargo, a pesar de que desde luego en el Estado español ha crecido muchísimo la movilización social y las personas es, son conscientes de la lógica de la austeridad, no hemos sido capaces de desarrollar un movimiento de masas como el que tú estabas señalando que están haciendo en Estados Unidos. Las últimas movilizaciones contra el cambio climático fueron escasísimas y el nivel del discurso alrededor de estos temas en las plataformas políticas emergentes y en las no emergentes, en las que ya existían, eh, que se sitúan digamos, en los entornos de emancipación y en muchos movimientos sociales que no son estrictamente eh, ecologistas, es aún muy, muy escasa. ¿no? Yo creo que ahí habrá una parte de responsabilidad eh, de la propia gente que trabajamos en estos movimientos, eh, pero creo también que toda esta idea que tú también señalas en el libro, eh, toda esta hegemonía cultural que se basa en la fe tecnológica, que ha hecho del crecimiento económico una especie de, de tótem, está cruzando esa manera de entender el mundo y nos está dificultando poder entenderlo. ¿no? Y bueno, pues, eh, ¿cuál es tu opinión un poco o, o en los movimientos que has conocido, cómo se ha ido desarrollando esa transformación? Um, so, it's interesting because I think uh, there's a, <clears throat> I think there's, 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 uh, uh, I, I think kind of there's a bit of a grass is always greener phenomenon uh, where certainly from a North American perspective, we look at what's happening in Spain and think, my God, this is incredible. <laughs> um, and, and, and particularly the ability to go from you know, street opposition into uh, political engagement at all levels of government, uh, it's extraordinary. And, and, and uh, so, you know, you, it's not as if you haven't been busy. <laughs> um, But I think that this idea that climate change, caring about the climate is a luxury that you can't um, focus on in a moment when people are worried about putting food on the table is an idea that in part stems from decisions that were made by the green movement um, in, in Europe and also in, in North America to advance policies uh, that were not just, that did not put justice at their center, that did not have an economic uh, justice framework. So they passed on the cost of uh, transitioning to green energy or you know, buying green products to the consumer. And there was a perception that going green was expensive, first of all, um, and, 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 and so it made sense that this is something that was very fashionable when the economy was booming and then immediately went out the window as soon as there was an economic crisis, right? And if you think about Al Gore's climate movement, you know, it was very much, it was pretty glitzy, you know, it was Hollywood, big green NGOs, um, And, uh, you know, I was like, Vanity Fair launched a special annual green issue, which lasted two years. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's really interesting to track, like, there were all of these, for instance, all these green products that just ended in 2009. The market completely disappeared. So I think it's, it, it, it's it, the green movement has traditionally been 
in North America, not in the global south, a very neoliberal movement. And it also um, addressed mm -hmm. the, the public primarily as consumers, right? So it was like, okay, here's climate change, here's what you should buy, here's what you should wear, here's how you should shop. It assumed all of this disposable income. Mm -hmm. um, and the message that working class people got was, this is a rich people's problem, you know? This is a problem to care about if you don't have anything real to care about. <laughs> um, so that march in New York City, that 400 person march, what was remarkable about it was not just that it was big. What was remarkable about it was that it looked and felt like New York City, which is a very diverse city, a very immigrant city. It was the only environmental march I've ever been to that was predominantly non-white, working class. Um, and that's because a lot of work has been done in building an actual environmental justice movement that connects what we need to do in the face of the ecological crisis to people's need for jobs, infrastructure, cheap or free transit, um, and, uh, and also connects it with pressing issues like asthma, you know, um, uh, you know health issues that, that disproportionately impact poor people because that's where the dirtiest industries are cited. In the United States, that's very racialized. That's very much broken down along race. But here, it's very much broken down along class. So this is really about building a climate justice movement, not just a climate movement, but a climate justice movement. There's a group in the United States um, that I love and do a lot of work with called Movement Generation. And their slogan is, transition is inevitable, justice is not. And it's the justice part of it that we need to build together. Si sí, yo, yo vamos en la experiencia nuestra de las personas que, que estamos aquí articuladas en, en muchas de las lógicas que, que han ido saliendo alrededor del 15M, la experiencia es bastante similar, es decir, eh, ha, ha sido posible conectar algunos de los elementos de la lucha. Por ejemplo, es muy significativo que todo lo que ha sido la denuncia con las infraestructuras, o sea, con la construcción de infraestructuras absolutamente irracionales que se han desarrollado en el Estado español y que han servido de base para construir todo el discurso de, eh, de, la, de la corrupción y también tipificar a la casta, eh, que de alguna manera estaba, estaba, de algún, eh, estaba sometiendo a la población a, a todo este proceso de, de, de sometimiento y de, y de precarización, eh, yo creo que ha utilizado mucho de ese, de ese trabajo. ¿no? Pero, sin embargo, y yo creo que hay eh, también el papel que aquí, al menos en el Estado español, juegan los sindicatos es importante. Eh, sin embargo, la idea de que vale hacer crecer la economía o vale resolver las necesidades de la gente a costa de cualquier tipo de empleo, yo creo que sigue estando muy, muy instalada. ¿no? Y que nos falta hacer esta, eh, establecer esta correlación, que es evidente cuando miramos el territorio, de que precisamente aquellas lógicas que prometían que iban a crear mucho empleo son las que han destruido el territorio y una vez destruido lo que te encuentras es que somos récord en infraestructuras inútiles y récord en personas sin empleo. ¿no? Es decir, que la lógica que destruye y precariza la vida de la gente es la misma lógica que destruye la naturaleza. ¿no? Y esa conexión es la que creo que debemos hacer. I, I just agree. <laughs> um, yeah, um, but I think I think that the, the, this this does um, this the issue around growth does point to the fact that you know I, I'm making an argument about the profound threat that what we need to do in the face of climate change challenges um, the logic of neoliberalism. And it's very clear. And this is why, if you look at who denies the science of climate change, it is overwhelmingly 
the most right wing, most uh, you, you know market fundamentalist institutions. This is what has given birth to the whole movement of uh, climate change denial. It, it's not a scientific movement. It's a movement that was born and incubated inside the free market think tanks that sold the world neoliberalism. Um, it's very direct and very causal. At the same, but but at the same time, the left is not immune <laughs> to these threats because tr you know traditionally we have been having battles over the distribution of the spoils of extractivism and growth. We haven't been having deep debates about the very logic of extractivism and the assumptions that nature is limited, whether in its ability to provide resources or absorb our pollution. Um, and we know that the industrial state socialist Soviet style uh, economies were horrific from a climate perspective and an environmental perspective. Um, uh, so it isn't, it isn't the case that just because this challenges the right, it only reconfirms the ideas of the left. It reconfirms some of our ideas. Uh, you know, we tend to believe in the public sphere, we believe in regulation, we believe in market interventions, but generally this, this challenge to growth is a big problem for developmentalist, uh, uh, Keynesian, um, even traditional socialist thinkers. And I can tell you for myself that I have, you know, m my own research into climate change has forced me to challenge m my own ideas and, uh, around economic growth mm -hmm. and natural limits. And, 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 and we see this play out very dramatically in Latin America where um, you have increasingly uh, intense conflicts between left-wing or center-left governments in Ecuador, Bolivia, Brazil, um, Argentina, if you want to call it center-left. Um, am I missing any? Venezuela. Um, uh, and um, and, and anti-extractive movements led by indigenous people in all of those countries. Um, that, but at the same time, we're also, I think Latin America is also leading, uh, leading the way on developing a post-extractivist um, progressive worldview that is drawing on the knowledge of indigenous people, um, and, um, but also updating it and, and, um, and, and modernizing it. So, uh, but I think we can't, we, we, we can't underplay the extent to which this is a challenge. You know, when I listen to Alexis Tsipras, I, you know, I'm still hearing the same, mm -hmm. we just need to get back to growth, let us get back to growth. Um, and that's not enough. Uh, you know, I actually believe I, that if Tsipras talked to Merkel about climate change, she would be far more destabilized than, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 than talking to her about getting back to growth. Sí. Y por último, para terminar esta, esta parte y dar lugar a, a un pequeño ratito de, de preguntas, a mí ha habido una cosa en el libro que me ha encantado, que me ha parecido... Eh, porque me ha parecido verdaderamente notable, sobre todo porque es una cosa que te sueles encontrar mucho cuando hablas de crisis ecológica y de crisis civilizatoria. Y creo que abordas muy, muy, muy bien toda la cuestión del miedo, de una forma muy, muy compleja. ¿no? El miedo de las personas cuando son conscientes de que están ante una situación de cambio y ante una situación de incertidumbre que pone en riesgo nada menos que el mantenimiento de la vida de los seres humanos y, de, y del resto del mundo vivo, ¿no? pero de los seres humanos sobre la Tierra, el miedo ante eh, los cambios que pueden venir. Si pudieras compartir un poco con todos nosotros algo en ese sentido, creo que, que sería muy interesante. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, so part of what I wanted to do with this book was write a book about climate change for, book, for people who don't read books about climate change. <laughs> um, and I was one of those people. 
<laughs> and so I, you know, I tried to think about why it was that that what was it that was alienating for me about many of the, you know, many of the the, the ways in which climate change was presented, uh, and. I think a lot of it was that it was just so um, technical, so jargon laden, uh, that it made me feel like this is for somebody else. And and you know when you're talking about climate change, you have three layers of jargon to contend with. You've got scientific jargon, you've got policy jargon, you know feed in tariffs and cap and trade, and it's you know it's, it's very hard to understand for normal people. Um, and then you also have the United Nations, which is its own language unto itself, okay? So when you actually open up one of these texts, you just see the sea of acronyms and numbers and, you know, we have to get below 30%, below 1990 levels by 2050. This is not a slogan. This is, this is, it makes people's eyes roll back in their head. So. That's why, you know, in the book I included a, some writing that is much more personal than I've included before because um, I feel like we are in denial about how emotional this subject is. And, we're, and the more we talk about it in this highly technical, jargonistic way, um, the more uh, we alienate people. So. Yeah, I, I I write about my miscarriages. I you know I write a, and and how you know going for instance I had a miscarriage. I lost a pregnancy while I was covering the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster, mm -hmm. um, and I wrote about that. I described it as a miscarriage inside a miscarriage because I was out on the water in the Gulf of Mexico during spawning season, the time of year when all of the 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 fish and are are spawning are, are and the the spill you know the spill happened at the worst possible moment when you had all of this very vulnerable proto life just in you know riding the waves and vulnerable to these waves of toxins so it was like this invisible death because this was life dying before it was born and, and yeah, so I wrote about this very personal experience of finding out that I had been pregnant and that I had lost a pregnancy while I was there. Um, and it's, you know, it's a little bit uncomfortable for me because it's not the type of writing that people are used to hearing fr from me. But I just decided, well, you know, I'll write about it um, because maybe it'll open a door for other people to think about uh, the, their own ways in which they, they feel this crisis. Because you know, when we say, oh, I don't care about climate change, um, you know, I'm too busy caring about something else, what I find is that that often masks a profound terror that's just underneath the surface because there's nothing more destabilizing than being told your home is unsafe, whether that is your personal home or whether it's your collective home. So this idea that we don't care about climate change is a lie. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's impossible not to care about um, the death of our collective home. It's just that we don't know how to express it, so we have to experiment a little bit. <laughs>